Praise God. This morning, um, about 4.30 in the morning, I uh, was waking up and the Spirit of the Lord was speaking to me and He told me to, uh, to read Isaiah 63, 64, and 65 because He said that America and the rest of the world and Israel is found in those scriptures. And what 63, 64, and 65, the chapters in Isaiah are all about, is this interaction between Israel and the people of Israel who are so oppressed and so um, wrapped up in the consequences of their sins that they're crying out to God. And you see that God answers anybody who will call out to him. But there's conditions that God brings forth. But there's also the idea that God said that in the midst of all of the mess that was going on in Israel and the midst of what's going on in our world today and in our country today, in the midst of all of that, God promises that he will take care of his own. And we're going to read some of those scriptures. And I've titled this message, Oh, That You Would Rend the Heavens and Come Down. Because some of you here are wishing, hoping, praying that God would come down and be able to deliver you from your circumstances, whatever they are, the financial problems you have, the economic problems you have, the social problems you have, the diseases that you have, the depression that you have, the family problems that you have. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. Isaiah 64, verses 1 and 2, actually says that, and that's the title of the message. It is the cry of those people of God that were still in Israel that were hoping that God would listen to their prayer. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains would tremble before you, as when fire sets twigs ablaze and causes water to boil, come down to make your name known to your enemies and cause the nations to quake before you. This is an invitation by those that were in Israel that were sick and tired of what they saw going on in their nation and they were calling out to God. And there are millions of Christians in America today that have had it with the state of America and they're praying. We're watching the comic um, arguments and, and uh, things that are being said by those politicians who want to try to rule this nation and the nation is in such a mess. But God promises that he's going to answer our prayers. And then in Isaiah 64, verses 7 to 12, these are the people of God that are confessing the sins of the whole nation before God. No one calls, in verse 7, on your name or strives to lay hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and made us waste away because of our sins. Yet, O Lord, you are our Father, and we are the clay, you are the potter, and we are the work of your hand. Do not be angry beyond measure, O Lord. Do not remember our sins forever. O look upon us, we pray, for we are your people. In verse 10, your sacred cities have become a desert. Even Zion is a desert. By the way, Zion in the New Testament is a representation of spiritual Zion made up of Jews and Gentiles who are believers in Christ. Even Zion is a desert. Jerusalem, a desolation. Verse 11, our holy and glorious temple where our fathers praise you has been burned with fire and all that we treasured lies in ruins. And verse 12, after all this, O Lord, will you hold yourself back? Will you keep silent and punish us beyond measure? Now, of course, we know that people that don't know God are not praying this way. But there are millions of Christians in America that are hearing the voice of God and they, they're beating with the heartbeat of God and they're tired of the unrighteousness. They're tired of where this country is going. They're tired of people trying to justify sin under the guise that it's love when in reality it's immorality and it would be wrong for any of us to be able to practice these things because it's the way that Satan ties us down into a sinful life and chains us to an eternity without Christ. Because the Bible says that Satan blinds the minds of the unbelieving that they will not come. The glorious light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But God doesn't want you to be that way. He doesn't want your family to be that way. But we who are crying out to God can rest assured that God will never leave us. And no, he will not forsake us in America. 
that was my concern. God, are you going to leave us to the results of the, the majority of individuals that have strayed away from you and taken this nation off the beaten path of the Judeo-Christian ethics that made it such a firm foundation? And this is what God said to Israel and he's saying to us today in Isaiah 65, verses 13 to 19. Therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says. And this is God answering. Remember I said Isaiah 63 and 64. The people are crying out to God and God is answering through the prophet. Therefore, the sovereign Lord says, my servants will eat, but you will go hungry. My servants will drink, but you will go thirsty. And who's he talking about? He's talking about those that have either walked away from God and don't want him or refused to retain God in their knowledge, such as the educational systems in America and the political system for the most part. That talks a real Christian thing, but we don't see any changes that happen in America. We see laws changing that are contrary to God's laws in this nation. But God will not forsake us who are believing in Him. God will not forsake those that truly love Him with all of their heart and all of their mind. God will not forsake Him. And that's why He's saying here in this answer. My servants will eat, verse 13, but you will go hungry. My servants will drink, but you will go thirsty. My servants will rejoice, but you will be put to shame. And my servants will sing out of the joy of their hearts, but you will cry out from the anguish of heart and wail in brokenness of spirit. You will leave your name to my chosen ones as a curse. The sovereign Lord will put you to death, but to his servants he will give another name. Whoever invokes a blessing in the land will do so by the God of truth. Not lies, not promises that are empty promises by politicians who care nothing about anything other than trying to get into an office but don't make so many changes, regardless of what party they're in. God is the God of truth, and that's what we want. But if there was a man of truth that wanted to be president today, he would not get elected. If there was a man with true integrity and true in character, which there may be in this electoral process, but he's way, way down in the list of those who are popular because people basically vote their pocketbooks and they vote their wants and their wishes, but they don't vote on uh, truth. They don't vote the way the God of truth would say to do things. And as a result, God says this, that in the end times, behold, I will create a new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor they will come to mind. In verse 18, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I create, for I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people, and the sound of weeping and crying will be heard no more. In my, in my half awake, half sleep, I saw Jerusalem re rejoicing, and I'm talking about Jerusalem, the real Jerusalem. Not us who are already rejoicing in Jesus. But I saw a time coming when Jesus was going to do and fulfill what he said he was going to do. He gave the land to the Jews, and he gave a promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I see that there are thousands of Jews rejoicing. Thousands of Jews are praying that the Messiah would come and deliver them from the enemies that are around them. While the rest of the world thinks that, that Israel right now is just making this stuff up, and they are the problem in the Middle of the East, in the Middle East, but in truth. In truth and reality, the God of truth says that I gave this land to this people and I will come back. And Jerusalem is the apple of his eye in the natural. But also we who are spiritual Jerusalem and those Jews that have accepted Christ as Lord and Savior are a part of spiritual Jerusalem. He will never leave us and he will never forsake us and he will feed us when others are starving. Because God's word will always remain true. The Bible says heaven and earth will pass away. But my word shall remain forever. So I say to everyone, Christians not only here, but Christians that are listening to this message and Christians that are listening to their pastors who are telling the truth and not trying to just paint a picture that everything is okay and God just wants to bless us. There are no blessings that can come to an individual unless he's willing to repent of their sins. That's what the Bible says. There's got to be a change in the heart so that the blessing can take root. There's got to be a change in the heart that grace can have its perfect work. There's there's got to be a change in the heart that faith can arise within the heart and do miracles and healings like Jesus said we would do because the greater works will you do because I go to my Father. 
And God will shake the heavens and the earth, and he will shake off everything that is not of him. He will shake down, and he will pull down all of these idols that we trust in so much. Some trust in horses and some trust in chariots, as the scriptures say in the Old Testament. But we will remember the name of the Lord. And the lukewarm church in America, and what is a lukewarm church? It's a church that tries to say how much God loves us. The world tells us that God loves us. Even if they don't believe in Him, they say that love is love is love. But in reality, there is a sword that determines whether or not something is of God and what is not of God. And the Bible says that the Word of God is quick and powerful. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. It can cut and divide between soul and spirit. And what we have is a lot of soulishness in churches today. A lot of uh, emotionalism and a lot of things that feed the five senses. But God wants the Word of God to cut and separate and divide between soul and spirit. And when you have your spirit separated from your soul for an instance in that secret place. When you get alone and shut the door, you see yourself the way God sees you. And when God sees you and you see him the way he is, you recognize just like all of the great men and women of God that had a visitation of God when they prayed. The first thing they do is said, whoa, I am a person of unclean lips and I dwell in the land of unclean people. But then with that confession comes the answer of God just like he answered Israel in chapter to 65 he came down and an angel came and touched their mouth and there was no more filthiness at all and in the new covenant we realize it's the blood of Jesus Christ that never loses its power to cleanse from sin and God will never cast us away we just need to turn to him can you say amen, amen. hallelujah I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take light and delight in my people in verse 19 of Isaiah 65, the sound of weeping and crying will be heard in it no more. I want to show a video of a revival that took place in 1970 at Ashbury College in Kentucky. These people, some students, were sick and tired of just the Christianity the way it was. And Ashbury College was a Christian college, but it was ho-hum. It was like a lot of Christians today, just ho-hum. But there were some Christians that said, you know what, we're going to pray to God. And we want to see if God will really come. And God would really mix things up a little bit. They wanted to find out if God was truly real. And not some kind of a phony thing. That God was really real and that God would come down and convince them that he was real. Let's run this. And uh, then we're going to discuss it. But I think a picture's worth a thousand words. And by the way, the video was recorded in 1970 before video. Okay, so it was done on a Super 8 camera, most of it. And uh, therefore, it's in black and white. And some of you don't even remember the fact that there were no cell phones back then. There was no uh, video cameras. And uh, everything was done in a different, different way. But let's watch this and then we'll talk about it in a little while. Amen. Pretty powerful. Uh, 1970, they didn't realize it. But... There was a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit all over the world. Um, I got saved in this outpouring in 1974, four years after this revival. But the revival broke out at uh, Notre Dame University, a Catholic uh, university where nuns were praying for God to move, and they got the Holy Spirit. And even though it was rejected by the Catholic Church, you couldn't stop God from moving in their hearts. Since I've traveled, um, I tr I've traveled to uh, South America, and uh, met in conferences of individuals that at the same time, the late 60s, early 70s, it was an outpouring all over the world. Now, they didn't realize it. But why I like about this video is because you notice a couple of things. Number one, there, were no, uh, there was not a Hollywood set. Number two, the music to us would be a little corny because uh, they didn't have, uh, well, they were singing from their heart. But I think the most profound thing is that you notice that the, that the influence was on God's manifest present in their midst. And it caused them to do exactly what he's always done when he's visited a people. He's caused them to be able to see themselves and their wretchedness of sin and their problems and be smothered in the love of God and told that he will wipe away their sins and came to set them free. This is what saviors do. I want to close today by reading some scriptures 
that are just exactly where we are at today in the American um, cultural war that's going on, which basically Christianity lost in the sense that the predominant culture in American society today is antichrist. And what I mean by that is sinful. Uh, the morality of God no longer exists in any of our public institutions. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't exist in any of our educational systems. They're not allowed to teach any of the morality of the, uh, of, of the Word of God or even mention Jesus is a very difficult thing in a lot of school systems. Uh, but we know that God answers prayer. Remember what we started today and we read Isaiah 63, 64, and 65. If you have a chance, read those three chapters. It's an interaction between sinners and individuals that were mixed in there that were hoping that God would not leave them in this state. And God came and answered. That's the point. That no matter what you've done in life, no matter what sin it is, no matter whether you're in prison or you've done despicable things that you're so ashamed of and you don't want anyone to ever hear of it, God will forgive you for these things. And if you become uh, a believer in Jesus Christ and allow his blood to forgive and cleanse you, all the old things will pass away and everything will become new. Can you say amen to that? Two scriptures and then we're going to pray. Revelation chapter 3 verse 20. Here's Jesus at the end of the book. He says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. You see, God hasn't forsaken America. America, for the most part, forsook God. But God is standing at the door knocking. And if you hear his voice, if you call out to him and say, God, please accept me where I'm at and show me what I need to do, his presence will come again. That was a sovereign, sovereign revival where millions of individuals of every single denomination in Christianity, the Baptists, the, Pente uh, the, the Pentecostals had a tremendous change going on in their life. The Methodists, the Presbyterians, even though many of these churches might have fallen away in these last days, and this is the last days right now, there is a great falling away. And in this particular time was the Vietnam War. There were still a lot of believers in Jesus Christ in our nation. That was 46 years ago. Look what has happened in 46 years. But if the people who are called by my name, says the Lord, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. And that's the part that has to be added into all the preaching in America. Rather than God just wants to keep blessing you and blessing you and blessing you with all kinds of blessings without any kind of a change in the inner person. He puts a band-aid on the flesh. You're still mortally wounded unless Jesus can set your spirit free and that you can see, exemplify and have the presence of God working in your life. And this is the words what I close with in Acts chapter 2, verses 38 to 40. I will continue to read this until Jesus takes me home. Peter, when they ask, what shall we do? Peter replies and says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit just like they did in that time. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. And he's knocking at the door of all of our hearts and all of our family members that are not here right now. Never give up praying for them. Pray for them in the Holy Spirit and believe that God is going to save your whole household and never quit on that. And then he said this with many other words. He warned them and pleaded in verse 40. Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And I declare to you that God has labeled America right now Ichabod, where the Spirit of the Lord has lifted off of American society as a whole. But the Spirit of the Lord will never leave His church. He lives within the heart of the church. And we who are Christians are filled with the Holy Spirit. And if we come together and pray and we seek His face, God will come. Can you say amen? Stand at your feet right now. And I'd like to close in a prayer. If anybody of you were touched by this film today and say, wow, that really got me, raise your hand to God. That really touched my heart. Praise God. 
think about some of the things that went on in there. There was no fanfare. There was no, uh, you know, dancers in the front of the church. There was no musician. I, didn't even, I heard a, an organ and a sax player who kind of like was a little out of tune. Praise God, I'm a, I'm a horn player. But all I do know is that the spirit of what was going on there was powerful. It was transforming. People walked into the room and they couldn't help but sense the presence of God. It bypassed the five senses. It bypassed the emotions of man. And it went right into the spirit. Because when you are in the manifest presence of a holy God, you can't do anything other than that they said in the Bible. Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the land of an unclean people. But God comes down and he says, I don't reject you. I've come to save. I've come to heal. I've come to deliver. And I'm coming back for my church, which will be without a spot or a wrinkle. Hallelujah. If everybody here that were touched by this thing said, you know what? I need to kind of get my focus. It's kind of like you need to get the binoculars in focus. And, uh, and, and, and like Jess was saying, don't live in the land of ore. In other words, it's like make a decision. Whoever's on the Lord's side, then you're on the Lord's side and pray. We can see things begin to happen. I want to see broken hearts bound up. I want to see captives free. And Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to bind up broken hearts and set captives free. And if you know somebody who's a captive right now, you can pray and start praying that God will come and visit them and set them free. He took some individual, by that, way, that one professor who stood up there. He was a professor in the college, in the seminary, and yet he had lustful sin in his heart. His wife even knew about it, and she was just praying and hoping that one day he would go ahead and deal with it. He didn't deal with it in secret. He got right before the whole school, and he confessed his sin. And what did his testimony do? They said, hey, if God could do that for him, he could do it for me. Get clean before the Lord. Get clean before the Lord. Let the Lord change you and wash away your sin and set you totally free. And when you're clean before the Lord, you feel so free. Because Jesus said, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Amen. Let's raise our hands and pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we are asking, oh God, that you would come and do it again, Lord Jesus. And we understand, Lord God, that we, Lord Jesus, as a people, Lord God, cannot dictate to you when you will come in your manifest presence. But Lord, we are hungry. And we are thirsty for righteousness in our nation. And you said, Lord Jesus, that those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be filled. So we're asking, oh God in heaven, that you, Lord God, would come and heal our land. Lord, we ask for forgiveness for the sins of this nation. And we ask, oh God, that you would break the back of sin. And God, that you would set captives free by your manifold presence. And that you would raise up individuals, Lord God, today that will not compromise the gospel, but they, they will go forward and they will preach the whole truth and nothing but the truth so help them God that the God of truth will once reign and rule in America society once again and Lord God that we will no longer Lord Jesus have to choose Lord God be between compromise and God but Lord your spirit Lord Jesus will catch us up to the throne of grace God and we know Lord God that we will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye come Lord Jesus in our hearts could you say that with me come Lord Jesus Come in my heart today. Bring a revival in my presence, oh God. God, set me free from everything that holds me back. From knowing you, and the power of your resurrected life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And amen. Don't you feel better? Hallelujah. Clean before the Lord. Glory to God.